Twitter also, as we reported or as we covered on Friday, kicked Katie Hopkins from their platform. And this, it seems, has created a bit of a tidal wave of right-wing figureheads moving from Twitter to this new application. Now, what is Parler? We can get it up, get up a, an image of the app. Parler pitches itself as a version of Twitter that supports free expression. It boasts that it's uncensored and it has become the home basically to the online far right and the Trumpian right. Um, since May, the website itself has been promoting what it's called a Twexit campaign. So it's a portmanteau, Twitter exit like Brexit, but Twitter uh, to get right wingers to elope from Twitter. This was especially after the row between Donald Trump and Twitter where they sense, well, they didn't, they just put a warning in front of uh, a tweet he had put out, um, which basically most people interpreted as calling for violence against protesters. Um, it was the one where he says, "If you when when the looting starts, the shooting starts." Um, but it took a month for this to hit British shores, and this weekend was when we saw Twexit take hold in the UK. Um, I found it very surprising actually, because I often thought that many of these people on the right would, you know, wanted to have this sort of barrier between themselves and Katie Hopkins, where they're like, "She's beyond the pale. We're not like her." But actually, it was her getting kicked from Twitter that created um, this move. Um, let's get up. Some of the some of the characters that went over. One of them is Darren Grimes, uh, right wing pundit, uh, Brexiteer. Hopefully, Parler app will work out. The chilling effect that big tech is placing on free speech, free expression, and freedom of association is deeply troubling. Conservative thought, mainstream thought, is under attack like never before. Um, we'll see in a moment how mainstream uh, the thought is on there. But it wasn't just right wing pundits like. Darren Grimes. Also, Tory MPs moved over to Parler this weekend. Um, let's take a look at a tweet from Ben Bradley. Having a crack at Parler gives a follow. Uh, he wasn't the only Conservative MP either. Steve Baker and Angela Richardson also joined. Emily Hewitson, who is another sort of popular right-wing pundit, often appears on Sky News, sometimes the BBC as well, I think. Uh, she tweeted, Parler is brilliant. Such a contrast from this depressing left-wing echo chamber. Um, then a few <laughs> hours later, it didn't take long. Only thing I would say, please don't use this app as an excuse to be racist. <laughs> it's grim. <laughs> so it didn't take very long for uh, her to work out what this was really about. And in case you were wondering, you know, is this app really racist? Are we just sort of tarnishing it? Is it just about free speech? Let's get up um, some of the hashtags that were going down on it yesterday. Oh, so this is Emily Hewitt's again. Just saw someone call part of the racist app. Do people ever learn? Calling people racist just because you disagree with them isn't normal behavior. Um, let's get up the hashtags. Uh, it, it, it's not just, you know, abnormal to call this stuff problematic. Uh, so this was a Twitter user who typed in Muslims. So this is what you get if you type in Muslims on the Parler app. So Muslims, no Muslims is the second most popular. Muslims are invaders, Muslim Brotherhood, deport all Muslims now. Muslims are terrorists, ban Muslims. Muslims are not refugees, Muslim peace, ban Muslim government. Uh, let's get up the next one. I think we've got the idea. Uh, this is George Soros. So George Soros is always one of the trending ones on there. Arrest George Soros. Uh, I can't even read that one. George Soros. Be it's Beelzebub in incarnate. What does that mean? Do you know what that the means? The devil. The devil. Ah, okay, good. George Soros plays Antifa. Um, George Soros <laughs> for the gallows. And then I think we can get up the general trending. So these are when you, that's when you search Muslims or George Soros. Now let's get up the, the general trending hashtags on the app. Uh, Fox News, deep state propaganda, hashtag civil rights. I imagine they're not for them. Um, Prey infiltration, treason, hashtag KKK, um, Democrat Party, voter fraud, which is the big <laughs> Trump line at the moment. Obamagate, which still no one understands what Obamagate is. Um, deep state and voter ID. Again, this the, the big Trumpian issue that people are going to try and steal the election. Um, I suppose you're taking, I mean, there's a few, there's a number of things to sort of, question about this i mean one of them is does the the argument that katie hopkins getting banned from twitter means that people will move into these underground applications which means they can be even more violent and that you've pushed it underground and ultimately i mean the hope of the right wingers is that they'll create this new platform where they can get more powerful 
Um, I mean, Twitter has 327 million users. I think Parler at the moment, less than a million. So, you know, it's probably not the best argument. Well, what do you make of this, this exodus from Twitter to Parler? I'll go to Ash first. Well, one of the things that I find interesting about uh, the far right's tactic is that they're in power, right? They've won, you know, they've got a government in Britain and America, two of the most powerful nations in the world. They've got a government which is very much aligned with their politics. And still, in order for their story to work, they've got to act as though the left are hegemonic everywhere, whether it's in the government, whether it's in the state apparatus, whether it's in the culture industry, it's actually... Michael, me, you and Aaron, who are running everything. Um, and so what that speaks to is um, I was listening to the new season of Slow Burn, which is about David Duke, uh, the KKK grand wizard who uh, won, I think, a race uh, as a state senator in Louisiana um, in the 1980s, I believe it was. And he would appeal to his base by talking about being a forgotten majority. And so what they're trying to do is speak to this idea that, you know, as Darren Grimes put it, mainstream opinion is, you know, now becoming, uh, you know, somehow shameful and dirty and it's being censored. Well, if that was the case, it would no longer be mainstream opinion. Right? So you're having to hold these two completely contradictory ideas uh, in hand at once. And it's about fostering the sense that really it's, you know, you, you know, white, uh, reasonably well off, right? They're often young people speaking to an audience of older people, Gen Xers and boomers, um, who are truly oppressed. It's, tr it's you who don't have a stake in society purely because you're operating within a, you know, pop cultural environment that thinks that you're all dinosaurs. Um, and that's apparently an assault on your free speech rather than other people using theirs. So strategically moving to an app like, you know, Parlay, it might make it easier to organize certain things. For instance, I, I think it was highly likely that, uh, you know, a significant amount of what I experienced was due to, you know, organization on that app. However, you're only powerful when you're speaking to that forgotten majority um, within the social in, social media environment. Uh, you know, you don't have the majority of people uh in the electorate who are on Twitter. Um, but then again, you know, Twitter is the you know biggest political uh, social media app around. And even that's a minority of your electorate and you're going to an even smaller one. Um, I think that strategically, it might not be that smart. Aaron, I want to get you to comment on the Tory MP element of this, because, you know, as I said, the timing of this isn't coincidental. On Friday, Katie Hopkins gets banned from Twitter. Over the weekend, lots of British right wing pundits start tweeting the hashtag Twexit and moving mm. over to Parlay, where she's just moved. And, you know, you could say this is just, you know, marginal people. It doesn't really matter. But you had three Tory MPs tweet that they were doing the same. So Ben Bradley, Stephen Baker and Angela Richardson are basically all joining in a movement to go to a far right application mm. or an application that's become home to the far right precisely because Katie Hopkins has moved over there. I mean, it seems bizarre that they felt comfortable tweeting about that this weekend. Well, these are the sort of hardcore of their, their cultural worries. And I think, you know, if you're a conservative, why would you be on Twitter? You've got, you've got the mainstream media, you know, Darren Grimes and Emily Hewitson go on the BBC every day and, and people say, well, Navarro go on there too. Well, actually nowhere near as much as them. And I, I think we've actually got something to say. Uh, but secondly, look, if you want if you want to get the radical left off the off the BBC and off Sky and you want to do the same to people like Hewitson and Douglas Murray, I don't think our politics are analogous. But if you want to do that, the right are going to take a far bigger hit than than the left are. Uh, you know, BBC Question Time every week has somebody with those politics, whether it's an Isabel Oakshaw or a Julia Hartley Brewer. Uh, if you look at the, the roster on LBC, Farage left recently. He was there for a while. Katie Hopkins used to have a show there. Nick Ferrari, um, you know, so I, uh, Ian Dale, you know, Ian Dale was lifts. He did the show the other day with Peter O'Born and Peter O'Born's listing all these sort of racist things, which Boris Johnson's done. He said, well, I don't think they're racist. He goes, well, are you a racist then, Ian? Perfectly normal question. Ian Dale gets, you know, oh, don't, don't call me a racist. Of course, Ian Dale constantly, his career is apologizing for people who are racist. You know, his great line in the 2017 general election was, let Linton be Linton, let Linton Crosby be Linton Crosby i.e. let the Conservatives win this on the basis of racism, bigotry and division. That, that's what he, he his stock in trade is. Uh, so 
in a sense, I wonder why they get so upset about Twitter. It's the one thing they, they don't do particularly well at. As Ash has said, it's not particularly influential in the grand scheme of things. It's good at sort of setting the landscape for for broadcast journalists. But other than that, not really. Um, if you think about it, they're even sort of, they've got this victim complex, even in regards to the BBC and the new director general. The new director general was literally a member of the Conservative Party. In the 1990s, he was running as a Conservative councillor candidate. I mean, what, what more would you like? Uh, it, it kind of it defies belief. But again, it, it taps back into a really essential point. The modern right has no understanding of political economy, has no solutions to the big crises of our era. We Nobody thinks that things have gone forward in the last 10 years. We've had 10 years of Tory government. Everybody knows things have gone backwards, whether it's home ownership, living standards, wages, schools, hospitals, public transport. Nobody thinks things are getting better. All they have is this paranoid style that's what they have the paranoid style great essay by richard hofstadter uh, in the 1960s and, and it seems to be getting worse and what i think this reflects is actually the politics of anti-communism of course anti-communism was a huge substrate of of right-wing thinking during the cold war it feels like anti-communist sort of thinking and rhetoric is now just basically going on to social democracy and I, I think that's what happened to jeremy corbyn and i think a lot of the left a lot of the center left because they don't like jeremy corbyn don't see that for what it is uh, the same thing more or less happened to Ed Miliband. The same thing will happen to Keir Starmer. You know, anti-communism, the lens of anti-communism is now inflected upon anything which deviates from right-wing social conservatism and effectively sort of neoliberal economics. And for a free society, that's really, really troubling. Uh, and so uh, there's the explanation as to why they have this victim complex. It's kind of, it's constitutive of their very politics because without it, they have nothing else. Mm -hmm.